Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Rebecca Bridgman, and I'm the Curatorial and Exhibitions Manager at Birmingham Museums. Um, a very warm welcome to everybody um, who's listening and watching in today. Uh, welcome to our panel discussion on women's identities in Bangladesh and its diaspora. We're delighted to be partnering with the Bengal Foundation for this digital programme to mark the 50th anniversary of the independence of Bangladesh. The programme is funded through the British Council's Digital Collaboration Fund. Um, and this event is linked to um, a, a screening this weekend of Rubaiyat Hussein's film Under Construction, which can be viewed on the Birmingham Museum's YouTube site. Um, you can see the link below, and I'll also post that in the chat for people um, throughout today's discussion. Um, please do use um, the Q&A for any questions that you might have. Um, and it would be also great if you could let us know um, where you're watching and listening from and what motivated you to come today and, and, and any other feedback that you might have. Um, so I'm just now going to um, pass over to the Bengal Foundation to, to Louvre Chowdhury, who's also joining us today. Hello, a very warm welcome to all of you and thank you for joining today's uh, panel discussion. Um, I think we're very fortunate to be able to collaborate uh, with the Birmingham Museums Trust um, in bringing Bangladesh 50 to you. Uh, and we would like to thank the British Council for their support. Uh, this program has given us the opportunity to present and share uh, narratives in film and uh, photography by Bangladeshi filmmakers and artists. Uh, which we feel should inspire and provoke new questions to examine um, identities, especially women's identities, and to uh, look at the journey of the past 50 years in a new light, we hope. I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Lotte Huck, who has uh, who's going to moderate this session, and the panelists who have joined, uh, Dina Siddiqui, Nilupa Yasmin, Rubaita Sen, and uh, Lotte, of course. Uh, handing over to you, Lotte. Thank you very much. I look forward to a very interesting discussion ahead. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me at this um, wonderful panel. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I will start by introducing our um, very wonderful panelists who will lead today's discussion. Um, so we have with us um, the director of the film that I hope some of you will have already had the opportunity to, to watch, Rubai Tosain. She is one of a few uh, female Bangladeshi filmmakers known for her critically acclaimed debut feature film, Meher Jan, which faced political and cultural wrath in Bangladesh for its anti-war narrative and its critique of masculine nationalism from a feminine point of view. Her second feature, Under Construction, which some of you have seen, premiered at the new director showcase at Seattle International Film Festival and was theatrically released and well received in Bangladesh. Her third feature film, Made in Bangladesh from 2019, based on real events, portrays the life of a textile union president. Rubaiyat used ethnographic research to make the film. Made in Bangladesh premiered at Toronto International Film Festival and is distributed by Pyramid Films. Rubaiyat uses a feminist lens in her cinema. She studied women's studies at Smith College and cinema studies at the Tisch School of the Arts, New York University. Rubaiyat has worked with women's rights organizations in Bangladesh and taught gender studies at Brack University. Alongside her, we're very delighted to have Milupa Yasmin, uh, who is an award-winning artist and educator. She is a lens-based practitioner whose work combines handicraft and the materiality in photographic explorations. She takes a keen interest in the notion of culture, self-identity, and anthropology. In her work, she draws upon her South Asian culture and heritage. Her research examines the principles of craft in art-based practice and particularly engages the principle of weaving. Her works combining lens-based practice and digital photography with craft practices to create works that thematically explore questions of gender, identity and heritage, while formally expanding the ways in which contemporary photography can utilize craft processes and aesthetics. Her work has been exhibited at the New Art Gallery Walsall, the Midlands Art Centre, Herbert Art Gallery, Art Gallery, and at the Coventry Biennial, Blast Festival, and Asian Women's Festival. 
She has had a series of commissions and residencies, including an engagement with Pachala, the South Asian Media Institute. She's given many public talks and workshops and has worked with school pupils. Nilupa is a visiting lecturer in photography at Coventry University and a studio holder at Grand Union, Birmingham. And last but definitely not least, we have with us Dina Siddiqui, Associate Professor in Liberal Studies at New York University. Her research and publications cover a range of issues grounded in the politics of gender, sexuality, and Islam in Bangladesh. Um, the anthropology of human rights, gender justice, and non-state dispute resolution mechanisms. She has been a visiting professor of anthropology at Brack University since 2013. She serves on the editorial board of Routledge Women in Asia publication series and is chair of the South Asia Council at the Association of Asian Studies and has published widely in these fields. Um, thank you all so much for being here. It is an absolute honor and delight to be able to be in conversation with you today and for us to take um, Rubaiyat's film under construction um, as our sort of starting point for engage a larger conversation about women's identity in Bangladesh and its diaspora. Thank you so much for being here. So I wanted to, to start by giving Rubaiyat the, the floor to maybe reflect about your journey with this particular film. It came out seven years ago and it'd be very interesting I think for everyone to, to hear you speak about um, your, your journey with that particular film. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And it's, it's, a, it's a real honor to be on this panel. Um, on the construction, you know, when you say seven years ago, I'm like, oh, was it really seven years ago? You know, it just, because I remember I came into Bengal office and I showed a cut to uh, Luvapa, if you remember, it was, the film was kind of still, we we're looking for distributors. Um, it was a very special film for me because, you know, with Made in ba with Meg Jan, I had uh, some negative reaction from the government, from some part of the society. And then um, Under Construction was a more personal film. It had nothing to really do with nationalism or Bangladesh, or but it really had to do with Bangladeshi women, you know, um, urban women and how they negotiate their identity. Uh, in, the, in this new new society, you know, which is literally under construction, the buildings, the city, the women. As it was really a personal story, it only had seven characters. Um, and to my surprise, it was very well received in Bangladesh. You know, I had two national awards. I was the opening film for Dhaka Festival, and I had very good reviews from my peers, other filmmakers. Um, and I remember we had this screening at um, public library that was only for women. Which was, uh, which was a, you know, a very good memory that I cherish because a lot of the women that I consider my mentor, uh, they came to the screening and there was this young mother with a little child who came. So I think with Under Construction, it, um, it really helped me to solidify my identity as a Bangladeshi director in Bangladesh. Uh, that, okay, this is the kind of content I'm gonna put forward. This is who I am. Um, and it was well received. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. And, and um, uh, can you maybe tell us a little bit about how it's uh, translated also internationally? So you screened it in, in Dhaka. And in fact, I saw it at the public library in Dhaka um, in 2014, which was an amazing experience. And, and I also remember this huge energy in the audience um, uh, and seeing the film. So this really um, uh, excited and, and, and yeah, the, the pleasure that cinema can give you when, when it speaks to you in this really profound way. Um, after that, the film has been screened, as, as you can see when the film opens, all the different selections and all the different festivals. How is the translation from screening it in, as you described, this very intimate, very personal, very deeply rooted way in Dhaka and then taking it on the road, let's say, into this large international field? Okay. Well, one of the things I should mention is uh, from under construction, I started making this very conscious decision to have more women in my crew. Because what happened in Mehjan was I was quite young and my crew was mostly men. And I felt like, okay, I'm being outnumbered in my own crew. This should not be the case. You know, I don't want to be the only woman heading a department on a film crew. So starting um, under construction, there were a lot of women in the crew. And if you remember from the public library screening, we invited all the women crew to come on stage. Um, so I think it was also a turning point for me as a director. 
you know, uh, that, okay, this is how I will, I will work. And when um, the, it premiered at Seattle, the new director showcase, and after that, it was in a few festivals in, 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 you know, like Stockholm and Sao Paulo, um, and I traveled with the film. Um, and my experience was it was always very intimate, you know, I think after the Seattle screening, a lot of women came up to me and they're from all different racial backgrounds. And they would say that, you know, I had this kind of relationship with my mother or I know I know what she's going through. So and I think that moment at Seattle, I really felt that, OK, there is something that's speaking to women. There's something women experience despite of their differences, you know, globally there, there's something in common that these women audiences, especially in Sao Paulo, you know, is very different from Bangladesh, but women could relate. Um, and finally, it was in this Asian festival in Basul, where it won three awards. And as a result of that, I had distribution in France. So it was in 22 theaters in France. So under construction also opened up the door for me uh, to the international market, you know, to have my film, because in Dhaka, it was in five theaters. A lot of owner, theater owners were like, you know, your film is 88 minutes, there are no songs, no stars, we cannot take this film. But I had 22 theaters, so it was kind of open enough for me also. If it's okay, I'd like to bring Nilupa into the conversation. I think there's some um, uh, overlaps here. So uh, one of the uh, exciting, I think, uh, uh, themes in under construction, um, which in part is what I talked about, which is sort of the struggle um, of, of operating as an artist, as we see in the film Roya tried to do um, in this, in a field that is structured um, either within a particular type of masculinity, as we see in the, in the theater um, group, but also there's a conflict over how we can adapt classical materials to the new moment, which I also see who by its film do. Um, and it's also something that I think um, your work does in very interesting ways, drawing on established craft forms within a very innovative photographic practice. Um, could you speak from your own practice and your own work and your experience about the possibilities and tensions between using this sort of traditional forms in quite maybe also traditional institutional frameworks um, and the ways in which you can then transform them through your presence, through your practice, um, maybe resonating with some of the things that Travai just pointed out. Definitely, thank you for that question. Um, I think to probably start off with, when you kind of consider the tensions that you get between using something that is very craft form based in an arts audience. You essentially are in many ways echoing the whole arts and craft movement that occurred within art history. And in order to make something that's very craft form based in an art setting has one kind of reaction from a group of people. But when you take that um, same craft form into a photography setting, suddenly it's almost seen as, you know, you're doing something that's not supposed to be done. And it's not to say that so many artists before me haven't done craft forms within their photographic means but I've definitely noticed the kind of reaction that you get from a lot of people when you're making forms of work that have established crafts within them so one of the things that I often found was that every time I was making images that were either with either cut up in some way where, whether they were woven together sewn together whether I printed them onto textile fabrics a lot of the time whenever you wanted to show that work in a photography audience a lot of the time people would just turn around and say this isn't photography so I think I got a lot of that criticism when I first started and when I first started off making this work and I think in a way it, it helped a lot because it helped me understand that you know why am I doing this why am I wanting to make work that has established crafts within them and I think a lot of it did help in my own research around um, the way gender roles are reversed through craft forms. I mean, uh, many craft forms are associated with women. They are known as women's work. And again, I even got that. I, when I started weaving for the first time, a lot of people just assumed it to be something that, oh, you know, maybe her mom taught her at home. So I think there was a lot of this idea of inheritance craft that came into the work, but also this idea of how, because I identify as a woman, it's almost expected of me to be able to do this and to be able to just pass this down. And I think that was something that is quite heavily influenced from the arts and craft movement. I mean, 
the whole reason craft as an art form was established because of the fact that it was not seen as a higher class art form. And I think a lot of those things um, start to kind of shape form from the movie as well. Now, I first came across the movie, not because of the craft work I was doing, but um, I was in my final year of my BA and I was doing a photographic project. So I did my BA in photography. And at the time I was working around identity and it was one of those kind of points for me where I really wanted to explore who I am, what it meant to be a British woman, what it meant to be a Bangladeshi woman, um, someone who identified as a Muslim woman. So I think a lot of those factors start to play into my own work and that's kind of when I came across the movie for the first time and when I first watched the movie I was watching it with this intention of looking at how the woman's identity changes whereas if if I go back now and when I look back at the movie I see the way that the crafts in the movie play such an important part in the way the woman's role changes and I think for me when I first came across the movie it was very it was very important to understand that you know movies like this are being made and giving a voice to women out there because you don't get movies like that that are actually talking about these issues that we face in our everyday lives which we talk to ourselves about we probably sit you know sit in front of the mirror and talk about but no one speaks about them in this outside audience and I think that's one of the reasons why I really resonated with the film when I did um, first come across it so I think it's just really exciting to kind of share the screen with Rubaiyat now and just be able to like speak about her movie I mean I feel I feel really cheeky speaking about her movie but um, I think it's one of those things where I found that if this can be done in cinema why can it not be done within so many of the different art forms and I think for me putting myself in front of the camera taking self-portraits making this work about me and about representation very much came from seeing movies like that seeing things that people before me have done because in a way they laid the foundation that I was able to almost play a part on and work on on top of because a lot of the time even now sometimes a lot of people haven't met a Bangladeshi photographer artist working in this field and a lot of time when I have these conversations I'm like I'm not groundbreaking there are so many people who have done it before me it's just because you don't get taught about so many of those or you don't go out and research them you don't realize that the world is really big and I'm just one of so many that have come before me so I think that's one of the reasons why I found that this movie really resonated with me and especially as an early graduate trying to make work and trying to go out into the real world I think that was such a poignant part um, but definitely when I think back to the movie now when I look at my own kind of history and craft and the way that crafts have changed over time the fact that you know it was doing something at that time that is still continuously carrying on and I feel like it's just building upon now and it's just exciting to see what will come from that but yeah I think that's kind of where I came from with a lot of the craft forms and how I related to the movie. Thank you so much. We'll come back to this question um, in a second. I want to bring in uh, Dina Siddiqui to share with us her, her response to the film, um, uh, especially given the fact you've researched over so many years the experience and conditions of, of, of women laborers within Bangladesh, specifically also garment workers. So I'd be very keen to hear your responses. Beautiful. Well, first of all, thank you uh, to the organizers. Thank you for having me. I'm, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm a big fan of Rubaiyat's work. Absolutely. And I love this film. So, And I have many things to say from a social science perspective. Totally not, I'm totally not trained in any kind of art criticism, film or otherwise. And my reading um, is, I suppose, more localized and micro in that sense. So my first comment is a general comment about how the film unsettles, I think, conventional, ostensibly progressive narratives. Okay, especially in relation to received notions of what constitutes women's emancipation and what constitutes the empowerment of poor women through factory work or otherwise through a neoliberal development discourse. I think the film, like Meherjan, in a very different way, and I, this is what I really appreciate about Rubaiyat's work, is the script forces us to enter and inhabit kind of uncomfortable zones. And I want to talk about these zones of discomfort, particularly in relation to class and feminist politics. But I, so this, um, there, and we get to hear about these voices in the interstices of, and I'm going to use the we as a middle class, we who watch movies, who consume movies, who make movies too. She brings in voices we would miss otherwise, or she, um, 
like the lift man who very typically whose name I'm forgetting, which is also telling about my class position, but I found it very interesting. Um, which means also that there are no easy resolutions and no pat endings. And I think one of the things about the ending is that life is very complicated. There is no neat ending. So for Moina, the garment worker, okay, her options, and I, Rubaiyat shows this in a very um, complicated, complicated way, how her options are between domestic labor, or backbreaking and sometimes literally life-threatening factory work, right? It's not that one is better than the other. It's not that one is more of an escape from the other. It's that given the structural conditions of inequality, this is what she has. And she has to negotiate her quote unquote free freedom or feminist freedom with the options that she has. Right? Or Roya, who on the surface has a perfect middle class existence, but who feels trapped by social conventions and expectations. And this is why when Rubaiyat was talking about how this is something that will resonate with women, if, you know, in almost most places. And I can see why audiences in Rio de Janeiro or wherever else, or Seattle, you know, would. Um, reach out, would find themselves in it, would identify themselves um, through it. But I think what she shows is the profound contradictions if we're going to talk about um, garment workers and garment work that's built into both um, capitalist development, neoliberal development, you can call it, and the project of nation building into which women, particularly garment workers are built. And I loved the shots. I saw the film again after many years. I didn't know how long it had been either, but I loved the scenes of Dhaka. I'm sitting, I haven't been to Bangladesh in over a year. And just seeing the, what, you know, the shots that you have of the city of half finished buildings. I think it's not simply the woman who's under reconstruction. The city, the nation, everything is under reconstruction and it's always a process. We're always half finished. Our lives are always half finished. Our aims are always half finished. I think you show that very nicely. So that's my general framing. The second thing is, um, maybe this is also uh, related to, I'm writing a paper on the issue of child marriage. So maybe it's, um, it struck me when I was thinking about the trajectories of garment workers or development discourse and women's work and the ways in which women are interpolated into nation-making processes, poor women, right? Um, there's a very pat narrative of girls getting married early, getting pregnant and their futures are ruined. And the underlying idea of what their futures are is that their futures are hopefully working in a factory. What you do, and I don't know if you meant to do that, it is a brilliant way of showing how limited that pat narrative is because this woman um, really doesn't have, what is her future? She says, um, and I'm getting to my second point, which is, um, so what she says is, Amar ki, ami ki shara jibon? She says to Raya, right? I think that's very important, which gets me to the second point, that, um, that the film is deeply attentive, not just to class, but to class relations among women. And I don't see that very often. And for me, that was actually very um, important because class relations, that relationality among women, is a blind spot in mainstream feminism, feminist discourse everywhere. So it's not particularly about Bangladesh, right? So middle-class feminist solidarity is usually thought of in deeply paternalistic terms, like in a rescue motor ideology, protections of ideology. Um, Roya has genuine uh, affection for Moina, takes care of Moina, but you know, so Moina can uh, sit on Raya's bed. It's a very liberal feminist, somebody trying to maintain equality. But at the end of the day, uh, Moina is the one tending to Raya's body, putting on the upton, even though, you know, she is the one, the labor. There's the laboring body and the thinking body, right? 
that relationship doesn't go away. And I think um, it's that point um, that, so, and there's another point, you know, where the mother's advice, when the mother finds out that Moina is pregnant, the mother said, why don't you lock her up? I told you, right? And having, <laughs> studying garment workers, it reminded me of the ways in which garment factory owners lock the doors of their factories, right? There's a, you know, so um, the resonances of class and capital and power are very, um, they come through if you look for them. I mean, you know, I mean, this is what I do. So it really reminded me of the deaths from factory fires because of locked doors, because of various ideologies that are at work. But I want to get back to the class issue, which is that I think one of the reasons women like young girls, like Moina want to go to the factory is precisely the I don't want to be a servant, I want dignity. Right? She is reaching out for dignity, no matter how dangerous the work is or how backbreaking the work is. That work, one of the things that the garment industry has done is really given, with all its contradictions and dangers, women a sense of identity. It's something you see in Made in Bangladesh, right? Uh, the film that, uh, the second film that you, uh, the third film that you made, right? Which is that women, it's not just a sense of autonomy. It's a sense of identity and dignity and having some control over your life. So it's not about financial autonomy there. It's a different, it's a kind of dignity that we in Bangladesh and our middle class slightly, I, I hate to use the word feudal, but I can't think of anything else right now, that we would not afford a chakor, that we might have to for a garment worker who we say in our fancy discourses are building the nation, right? So it's that dignity that she wants. But I think to her credit, what you show is that Roya ultimately recognizes the deep asymmetry in their relationships and manages to form some kind of feminist solidarity with Moina on Moina's terms. And you see it, Jokon, when during the wedding, Moina gives, um, Roya gives the gold and finally, uh, Moina returns it to her, to Roya for safekeeping. That's where the solidarity is. They know husband, you know, Goina Pele, Ni Chole Jetapale. And all women I know across classes do certain things with the gold that they get. I mean, there were certain moments of solidarity, but the moment where, to me, um, that Chakor thing is totally destroyed is when she goes. Um, when uh, Roya goes to Moina with a <clears throat> silver pile and she takes, um, she, you know, Moina pa, Moina's foot is on Roya's leg. That to me is the ultimate disruption and unsettling of particular bodily embodied class relations that women and men have. And I think that you're showing that. I don't know if that would happen in reality. But it's an aspiration toward feminist solidarity that I thought I saw in the film. And I'll stop there, I've talked a lot. But thank you. Thank you for giving me a chance to see the film again last night. Thank you, Dina. Um, I wanna give uh, Rubaiyat and then Nilupa the opportunity to respond to anything of the, that the three of you have said. And already a lot of themes and questions have come up. So if there's something you would like to pick up from that. Well, I could start crying here and being able to speak about my film. <laughs> That's all I can say because, you know, I, 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 don't, I think when, when I make a film, it's not that I think about all these things, you know, like I've never thought about that moment when uh, Roya is putting that anklet on Moina in, in that way, because in the film, what, what I wanted to show is that they really loved each other, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so that kind of came out in that way, but it, it's really it's really great to hear you talk about my work. Nilupa, I'm glad it's there. I think I'd I'd definitely add something you mentioned about how you pick pointed the whole entire movie, and it relates to something that I really resonate with 
that when I first watched the movie, I saw specific things and I didn't notice other things until when I recently watched the movie again and I noticed different things. And I think it speaks a lot about how as women in different phases of our life at different ages, we pick up on the different things that we see. And I think like when I first watched the movie, it was it just, I remember that one specific scene where her mother says to her like, do you know what they call actresses in Bangladesh? And I remember something that my auntie once said to me like, but do, do you know what artists do? And I was like, yeah, I want to be an artist and it's fine. So it was like a lot of things throughout the movie where at one point in my life, I felt like it re really resonated. Whereas when you rewatch it and then you pick up on different things and suddenly you realize that, oh, you know what? That, that was such a big part of that woman's identity and she needed to have done that to be able to get to where she wanted to. So I think a lot of that, a lot of the ideals around the movie, I feel really resonate because no matter who you are, at what age you're watching it, you'll find something from that movie and it'll, it'll teach you something that you can carry on. So I think that's something really powerful that the movie does. Right. Um, I just want to respond to something that Veena Appa had said, uh, which has to do with, uh, you know, feminist solidarity and class positions. And I think growing up in Bangladesh, it's something that you cannot ignore. We have all grown up with uh, like jackals in the house and, you know, Roya's relationship with Moina is really informed by these relationships I formed growing up with young women who had worked in my house and we would become friends. And then they would go away and next year they would come back to my grandfather's village with a child in the lap while I was still in school. So even if I loved them very much, I felt like at a, after a point, you can't really do anything about it. And after a point, the relationship cannot progress because of the way our society is built, like so strongly around class roles and you know uh, positions. And so that, that's definitely something that I thought about. And then when I made Made in Bangladesh, I went closer to that character. And one of the things that Dina Appa said is how little choices are for these women that either you get married at 11 or you work at somebody's house or the best option is to get a job at the garment factory. And the women that I did my research with calls it their office. They never say I'm going to the factory. They're like, I'm going to the office. That's but they so nice. consider themselves to be professional working women who have jobs, who go to office, they buy the clothes that they want to buy with the money that they earn. They have certain negotiating power and they also fight with the bureaucrats and these big owners and, you know, so I think that, that that's a real paradox there. Yeah. Lucy, I, I'm, I want to pick up on a, a slightly uh, related but slightly differently framed question, which is that all of you are, re are repeating and for, for right, of course, differently, but definitely Dina and Nilupa about what it means to see something again and just to, to grow with a with a with a text in that way, um, which is also what we see uh, Roya do in the film, in the sense that she, after a decade of performing this this role of this idealized woman, she comes to take apart and reimagine that the script she's been given, which seems to be significant in what you are all describing in how as women we inhabit particular types of possibilities and opportunities, but as we progress with this and we, we come to read the texts that have been given to us over and over again, we start to make small changes and see where the possibilities are, whether that is about going to the office as a garment working and, and sort of empowering yourself through being able to earn, which is in itself, I think, across the history of feminism, one of the core, you know, if, if you're able to earn for yourself, that allows a particular type of opportunity, but it also allows you to question. And unfortunately, I have not seen Made in Bangladesh, but it sounds that there is something going on in there as well about if you've been in that type of structure long enough, you are able to then say, these are the bureaucrats who need to make the decisions that are gonna make the improvements to my life. And I wonder whether each of you could speak maybe to this, so this question of how do received texts allow you to become critical as feminists, as, as makers, as critics, um, as, as audience members, there's a beautiful, I mean, for me, as somebody who's very interested in popular film, there, we see Moina repeatedly looking at popular uh, Bangladeshi films, she has the film stars on her wall, there is something very powerful, I think, about, about this question of how we engage the texts that are given to us, which put us into particular types of boxes and how we emancipate ourselves from that. It's not a very direct question, but anyone can pick it up. 
if you wanted to. No? Shall, we, shall we move to and to an, see if there's any audience questions, perhaps? If there's anyone in the audience who would like to pose a question, you can raise your hand um, and we can come to you um, at, that, at that point. Um, I think you're also able to send a text message to, in the chat to the, um, to the organizers, to the panelists. So um, do feel free to make use of that possibility. Um, I have a question for all three of you, which is about representation, which I think we're also talking about here. Um, so, Nilupa Rabaid, you're both lens-based practitioners working with the photographic image in different ways in your work. Um, and you're very, as we know, centrally concerned with the place of women in contemporary society. Um, Nilupa, I've been really enjoying looking at your Fuldani series, um, just these beautiful self-portraits um, in which you really reflect this beautifully on um, how women have traditionally be compared to flora. Um, and of course, in Rubaiyat's work and in under construction in particular, we have these uh, frequent visual references to mirrors and to wedding portraits um, that come up again and again. Um, and Dina, of course, some of your most famous work is about the representation of Muslim women in Western media and scholarships and how that distorts. Um, could I invite each of you to tell us something about how you think about films, photography, uh, popular media, uh, news media, uh, allow, relate to women's identities, but also possibly allow uh, opportunities for change. Um, shall we take it in the same order we went in um, the first time? Can I invite you, Rubaiyat, if you would like to reflect on that? Yeah, I think I'll also go back to your question about text. Um, because one of one of the early works of, of Dina, Dina Siddiqui is about women who, who worked in factories, you know, and there, I, there's a term like miracle machine. And when I was first uh, conceptualizing Made in Bangladesh, that was one of the pieces that I had gone back to. And this image of a woman who's a hybrid, you know, she's a machine. And that had, you know, that kind of stayed with me over the years when I had made, you know, I wasn't even a filmmaker, you know, kind of stayed with me. And when I wanted to make the film, it kind of came right up. Um, and when I was writing the script and visualizing, we really wanted to juxtapose the machine and the bodies, you know, like women's feet, women's hands, um, and these machines and how they really become um, kind of a partner to each other in finishing this big job that they have to do. There, there's a part in making Bangladesh where the Sims traces uh, very fondly touching the machine after she's been able to finish her uh, big load for the day, you know, so it's going back to that. And I think in terms of representation, I'm always, uh, I'm always looking at images of women in public spaces like billboards, you know, um, billboards are very, very interesting to me, especially in Dhaka you have now these very big life-size billboards and, and what are the billboards saying and juxtapositioning the billboard to the actual women. Um, that, that's something that I always find is an effective tool uh, because I feel like, you know, we don't see women's lived experiences in cinema or in the media. We see women in a certain way uh, where they're supposed to be visually pleasing for a certain gaze. So when you juxtapose that with the actual women, you, you really see the gap. Um, and also, you know, you talk about Moina consuming these images. Um, and also, you know, when I was working with factory workers, like the kind of films that they're watching um, and the kind of gender roles that they're informed by those films really affect the way um, you know, they carry out romantic relationships or intimate relationships. Mm -hmm. And they, put up with so much violence in the name of love, in the name of romance, which is common with middle-class women too. And I think a lot of this is informed by the images that, that we're kind of so saturated with. And I'll end there, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Nilupa, would you like to? I, I definitely would echo a lot of what Rubai said about how text becomes really important because of what you read around and what you're researching on. 
And it's funny you mentioned my series School Danny because that was very much inspired by a um, essay by Mary Wollstonecraft on the vindication of women rights. And I remember like stumbling across this essay and reading it and a lot of it was, it was not relatable to me as a woman of color living in Britain, but there were many, many ideals in it that I understood as, even though this was written in, I wanna say 18th century England, maybe I'm wrong there, but the fact 1792. that- 1792. So uh, the fact that it was written at that time, it's still so relatable today. And I think that's something that I found I needed to visually show in some kind of creative forms. And I think it comes to the idea of how where representation lies within creative forms, because it's something that is quite easily accessible to different people of different class, different um, ages. It's something that's readily available that people can access in different ways. So in a way, using things like photography, film, using things that are I want to say people use for fun, something that they enjoy doing, using those things to talk about political, social issues are really important. And I feel like that's something I find that I resonate a lot in my work, because a lot of the times I'm making a photograph that I in some way want to teach others about, whether it's teaching them about myself, which in some way or form becomes a representative of them too. But at the same time, it's always been this underlining issue of trying to learn who I am and putting that in through the images that I make. So I think for me, text has always played a really important part because I read what I enjoy and then in some way that becomes a part of the work. Or sometimes what I find is that if I've come across something that I've read is in some way resonating with the thoughts that I have, you always bookmark it and then you come back to it. And I think that's kind of been a process that I've really enjoyed doing. So I think those are a lot of things that I find really work hand in hand when it comes to making a lot of creative work. Again, saying that not all artists prefer that means that you find that this is quite structural in some way. And I think I find that it depends a lot in the way that you prefer working and you kind of want to make work. But I generally feel that when there is text readily available for us, not to not to forget that it's there and to always fall back on the fact that, you know, we have things that have been written, people who have researched so many different things. Um, because people spend this time researching this and even if you're almost skim reading something that someone's written somewhere in some way or form you're almost part of that journey that they've gone through in order to get to where they have in terms of what they're saying so I think it is very important to kind of work with what you have and trying to put all those pieces together in order to make something thank you yes um uh, and seeing your work behind you is sort of a visual um metaphor of, of that of that practice it's beautiful um, Dina. Yeah. Um, gosh, Rubayat, yes, I noticed the billboards um, in uh, under construction, and I noticed two in particular. One is of an Arom, uh, very graceful, elongated body, you know, and there there's another one of a garment worker saying something like, um, we're, you know, something about making the nation, you know, how important garment workers are for the nation. And I think you make the point very clearly in the movie that I also just noticed about how these visual cues are around us, about how to think, how to think about the middle class body who's going to shop in Arum and wear this beautiful shari, and how to think about the laboring working class body who's going to go into the factories and make things and then, and who has, who's, the posters that you see, again, getting back to class, you see in um, Moina's room are not the posters that you would see in a person probably who is buying the clothing from Aro. But um, I've been noticing, I mean, in terms of these visual kind of texts, I've always wondered about, you know, if you go a little bit into old Dhaka, or at least in the old days, there, there are these, um, billboards for borkas, and at least there was a certain point in time you had borkas from different places, Lebanese borkas and Bahraini borkas, all of that. And then you go to Gulchan, you know, too, and there are these women with their hair showing, you know, this, the hair ads for, you know, I don't know, not fair and lovely, but whatever the companies are, right? And it was, it's, it's so interesting how spatial these cues are too. And there's a speciality in it that I think is worth talking about in my own work. If you want to get to text and reading text, I had never read Mary Wollstonecraft. The reason I know the date is now I teach it. I had a new, you know, I was given the task of, um, I suppose you could call it decolonizing 
theory and Mary Wollstonecraft was one of the texts I had to teach. And it was like going back in a sense, I thought I knew everything about it. But if you read it very carefully, you will see that in 1792, her entire argument about why women in England, Christian women in England should be given the, the right to education is that they, so they could be better wives and better mothers, but they, so they wouldn't be the same as Muslim women who are enslaved in the harem, who are slaves, who are slaves to their passion and slaves to their men. And they're, that using, that juxtaposition, that's when you, you know, you come, I didn't come back to a text, but the teaching, you know, the Muslim women stuff, I see in different ways. And I see it obviously in these generic texts that circulate too. Um, you know, we live in this deeply, deeply, I, um, a world in which images of women are constantly made to produce boundaries, cultural, racial, sexual, and other kinds of boundaries. So um, that's how I would vaguely answer your question, except one thing, I love the idea of taking Rokto Korobi, which is like this poor text of Rabindri culture in Bangladesh, and moving it to the space of the factory. And it made so much sense that there would be complete resistance because, from the local, you know, the gatekeepers. So I just, you know, thought that was such an interesting move that you made, but it's sort of related to the point about taking Roya finding herself through the text. Thank you, Dina. Um, so we have, um, uh, this is a, a fascinating conversation. Um, uh, we have meanwhile a few uh, audience comments and questions that have come in who would li like to pick up. Um, so there, there is a direct question to, um, to you, Dina, which is about the, um, uh, the question. I'll just read it out and we'll share it onto the chat for anyone to read as well. Yeah. So um, uh, the question asks, um, how would you conclude the contradiction between the choices of early marriage, becoming a housewife, or becoming a factory worker? <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you, whoever sent that question. Very difficult, obviously. Do you want us to answer? Or do you want us to take well, questions? I think, or? I, think, I think we can, now that this one's come in, we can take that. Um, I think it's be nice if, if members of the audience would like to share their questions with us, then we can pick them up as they um, as they come in and enjoy the conversation. Yeah. Okay, right. Actually, there are two other questions too. But anyway, yeah. Okay, but I'll answer this one first. Um, if I I think to not the contradiction to recognize the contradiction at the very quick answer, and is to not have these standalone siloed movement. What you have now is a child marriage, anti-child marriage campaign in Bangladesh that is funded by God knows whoever, external donors, and that doesn't, that's very, um, doesn't take into consideration structural contradictions. It's very much narrow, legalistic. What is it, what do you do after you stop a child marriage? You abandon the child to what? Right. That's not that's that. Uh, these are the things that I think a close study of these issues can throw up so that one can deal. There are no easy solutions. That's the other thing. Development discourse wants easy solutions. You can't just change the, you know, the, the right, um, the level of uh, the age at marriage. We know that and not do a whole lot of other things. And this is not to say early marriage is good for women or girls. I'm not saying that. But these kind of cookie cutter interventions are deeply troubling to me. Or I, I have deeply troubling outcomes. It's not really about me. Thank you, Dina. I think that relates back to the, um, the, the seminal article that Drubayat also mentions, your 2000 piece. It was an EPW. Um, I've read it in a long time. Thank you for reminding me. Now I feel really old. Yeah, no, well, <laughs> that's how I met Lata, actually. I think, yeah. Um, so there's some comments also coming in um, on the uh, on the chat. Um, uh, our uh, fellow 
chair of Rebecca Bridgman can maybe put them into the general chat. Their comments about um, people comparing their own uh, circumstances to those of, of Roya and, and thinking about what it means to be a mother, an artist, um, uh, looking after one's own children or other people's children and how that relates us. We can maybe put these in the in the chat um, as well. Um, uh, can I um, uh, pick up on, on something that Dina said, which is about the, the use of, of this sort of classic rabindric text, so um, Rok de Gorobi, um, and, and I think um, one of the things that struck me, um, and it's, it's beautifully textured into the, um, into the film, and we see how these different women come to inform uh, uh, the sort of the final articulation of this new pregnant Nandini, which is based on all the other women characters in, in, in the film. Um, and I wondered whether, um, uh, uh, what was the trigger for you to go back to that particular particular text and and you know the netting that you see over buildings that are under construction I'd never really looked at them until your film made me do so and to think about what this hidden king is what is the thing that is behind the netting that's producing this um this this new society that we've that we've entered into um it's a very um uh, uh rich text of course but it's also an old text um how, how did you get to it and do you think um uh, if you see the changes that Roya goes through in the film, is that also something that you could see yourself um, uh, re reflected in um, as your, the challenges you face as a filmmaker? Do they map onto the challenges that she faces as, as an artist, as a, as a director to be in the film? Thank you for that question, actually. Um, well, Rock the Movie is one of my very favorite texts. I really like this text. and. Not only I like this text, there's a Bisho Bharati edition of it where uh, Rabindranath Thakur writes a couple pages of introduction about the play, mm -hmm. which is very informing because when this play was published, he had already won the Nobel Prize, but this play had terrible review from the West. Mm -hmm. Because here we are celebrating industrial civilization, the triumphs of it. And here comes this man from the colony who is writing a, a play where he's talking about your doom, you know, this yeah. is doom. And when we see Rana Plaza, we see that, okay, this is what's exactly what he talked about, that numbers, you know, people are defined by numbers, uh, yeah. their spirits are sucked out of them. They work with the dead things. Uh, they do not, they're uh, not connected with nature anymore. Uh, so I, I think it's so apt, you know, it's almost like a prophecy. Um, and he wrote this play one day, he was, I think, taking a walk and he saw this flower coming out of the rubbles. Uh, so, you know, it's also a text about hope. Um, and in under construction, we plant a tree in the Rana Plaza site and we, we film that, you know, you see that little flower sprouting. Um, but my problem with this text was always this representation of this woman. You know, uh, when I read it, when I saw it performed, you know, in Mohila Shamiti, the way, like, why does she have to be that way? So, like, I, I think I took the opportunity of this film to uh, question that, you know, to, to retell this and, and show how relevant it is, even today, that these women will never meet the uh, corporations they work with, so they never meet the king, you know. Uh, and there's these short bars where these middlemen, these, you know, so it's, it's very, very apt. But at the same time, you see that in his representation, the woman is not an individual. She has to be ageless, she has to be fertile, she has to be young, she has to dance and sing and care for everybody and wait for her lover to arrive who would bring some sort of an emancipation to this space. Mm -hmm. So I, I had that intention of like, I love the type, that's what I was also very really angry with. It. <laughs> so I took the opportunity of the film to do something about that. Um, and, you know, when I was location scouting for the film, I felt that there was not a single shot without the under construction building. That's when I changed the name of the film. And also, I, I find it to be visually very beautiful when you see these really long buildings and they're covered with these uh, jute uh, fabric. And then sometimes they have this net and they sway in the wind. 
it creates a, some sort of like a haunting landscape, like this urban landscape, these buildings. And I kind of wanted to bring that, you know, in, into the framework of the film. Like as Dinapa said that the city is very much under construction. You know, Dhaka is between rural and urban. We still have boats, you know? We have boats, we have rickshaw, we have hammers. We, we have all, you know, this whole spectrum. And the city is trying to really find who it is, you know, and so, so are the women. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, maybe connecting it to, to, to Dina's work on, you know, if we think about this city and the place of women and, and work, um, one of the reasons we're also having this conversation is 50 years of, of Bangladesh. Um, mm. uh, can you maybe um, tell us a little bit about how you see that transformation over 50 years of, of, of women's work in the city um, in, in Dhaka over that period? Right. Um, thank you. That's a big question. It is a 50 you years. If you, if you want. <laughs> right. No, no. Thank you. Um, um, yes. Uh, you know, 50 years ago, and I'm going to think about the city as well as the nation, because there's been such a conflation of working women, poor women, and the national laboring body, right? So 50 years ago, when Bangladesh came in, um, became independent, quite, you know, there was, of course, the, um, the women who had been uh, raped who needed to be rehabilitated, right? There was that. But in the national policy imagination, the woman was a reproductive body whose body needed to be controlled so the nation could go ahead. Um, so there was a lot of, you know, I was looking at yesterday, I just typed in women work in Bangladesh 50 years. And I got this, I got a lot of hits from demography journals. I was just seeing the changes. So women's issues came up in relation to population control. That's where the work, you know, if you had to control women's reproductive bodies, right? I think that's changed to, um, that changed in the 80s. And it's, a, a, I want to talk in a sense, I suppose I want to center the conversation in a, in a more global political economy. So as the, you know, as Bangladesh's relationship changes with the global order, women and work and their relationship to the city changes. As there is a privatization, neoliberalization, opening up of the economy, particular kinds of jobs come, very specific kinds of jobs for very specific. So um, the city, I mean, a lot of feminists have said this, that the women have made the city, um, working class women have made, have laid claims on social spaces that were otherwise male spaces, right? So you see the garment workers going out and that's what had, made it easier for um, middle-class women to also be out and be visible. That's at least, that's a claim. I suppose that's somewhat true because women are much more visible. Women's work, um, if we are talking about working class women's work, I think um, it's been, again, very contradictory. I think I was struggling. I was thinking of this question yesterday. I was thinking, how do I, you know, say anything really meaningful about it without just saying it's very complicated, which, you know, which is a terrible answer, really. But I do think that um, there's women's, uh, you know, now, of course, it's because of, I suppose, rising inequality because of global ideas of companion marriage of a particular kind. It's okay for middle-class women to work in banks. It's okay to work in a be heads of, you know, I think 20, 50 years ago, a certain class of women worked in universities. Perhaps they were professionals a little bit in high up jobs in ministries like our aunts and our mothers, right? But that was a very domesticated thing. What's happened now, sorry, is um, there's been much more of an expansion. So women are staying over late to work in a bank because they're bank managers, right? But there's a very small class of women who can do that. The, the conception of women um, and space and respectability is still a little bit stuck. 
So if you are a very wealthy woman, your car will pick you up at eight o'clock at night to take you home and you will be safe. And maybe your husband will maybe even be in the car, who knows, because whatever. But it will be a protected kind, your respectability will be protected. If you're a garment worker and you, there's a shipment due, you're going to, you don't have a choice about staying in work, at work. But, the, but so what has not changed is, and what has become much worse, I think, for is rising public insecurity, which I think changes the equation for women and work. Because there are there is no infrastructure. With privatization, you have less and less of public infrastructure. And for a lot of reasons we probably shouldn't even go into, there is huge impunity. There's a huge culture of impunity. Between that, I think working class women are really, in a very tough situation. So I would say that's, you know, there have been many changes, but it is so hard. And I think one of the things working women face the most is this fear, this sexual harassment and public insecurity. And I think that's where we really need to talk about in a, you know, not just through giving men training on sexual harassment. I don't think, I think the power relations go much deeper. Those power, you know, the sense of male entitlement is there with people, working class men, as well as men in corporations, but to tackle that takes more than just, I don't know, diversity, the equivalent of diversity training. Sure, and, and that's definitely, I think, in, in the context of the UK at the moment, something at the forefront yeah. of many people's, uh, many people's minds, and definitely I can see, even though a few people are on campus, the university students in particular taking absolutely the lead on um, <sighs> bringing some of these issues about impunity, sexual harassment, public insecurity. I mean, I, I don't want to do a comparison between here and there and somewhere else, but this is definitely a set of questions that is right at the forefront here today, too, irrespective, I think, um, right. of where you are. So I think there's, um, there's a larger conversation here um, that is both particular to Bangladesh as well as... as right. Uh, Nilupa, could I turn to you to, to also ask you a question about this 50 years um, uh, of, of an independent Bangladesh um, from your perspective, and particularly also in relation um, to, to the work. I, I looked at some ongoing work, I think, of yours, Pasha, where you weave Bengali words together into these beautifully intricate patterns. And, and of course, it reflects on, on the question of, of the power of language and the ways in which words produce particular types of environments and possibilities for us. And of course, language is central to our understanding of, of, of the liberation of, of Bangladesh as well. How, how, um, how do you um, think about this, this particular work and, and your collaboration with a Bangladesh-based artist, as well as the larger sort of question of what does it mean for you, this, this 50 years of, of independence? Thank you for that question. Um, I think working with a Dhaka based artist, so I was, when I did the project Basha, I was actually working on a digital exchange with an artist called Shamsul Alam Hilal, who was in conjunction with the Patshala in Dhaka. And it was great to kind of be working with people who didn't have to speak English with. That was one of the one of the biggest things because a lot of the time, sometimes you're trying to explain something and you realize that, okay, there's not an English word for this and it, you're the best translator in Bangla. So I think that was one of the things that I found when um, when I was having these conversations with Shamsul because he, we, we were speaking in, in English predominantly and what I found quite crazy was the fact that he was based in Dhaka. My family's from Silet, so the dialects differ. And on top of that, he wasn't originally born in Dhaka, so he had his dialect from where he was originally born. So it was crazy to see how we were almost trying to make sense of different words between us. And I think that's where a lot of the work kind of established from because it was something that connected him being in Dhaka and me being in Birmingham and being able to do that together. So I think that was really exciting to kind of have that connection with someone. And more so because it was something that was relatable to another artist. And that was quite different for me because I've always I predominantly been making work in a very Western audience purely because I, I've not come across many other artists around the same demographic of where I live right now making the same work. So it was always exciting to be able to have RT conversations with someone without having to almost not dumb it down in a way and I think that was really um, interesting and I found it quite encouraging that he was so in a way 
prideful about the fact that, you know, living in Britain, I was making work about being Bangladeshi. And I, I found that a lot within my own like family, like my parents, I find that a lot whenever they see me making work and they're like, but then who really wants to look, look at the work if it's about Bangladesh? And I was like, you'd be surprised how many people actually do in Britain want to, you know, work and look at this work that's been made about Bangladesh. And I think being born and brought up in Britain, it's been very different in the sense that a lot of the kind of customs that I'm used to, a lot of the values that I've been born and brought up with are very different to what I would have been if I was born and brought up in Bangladesh. And I think one thing I found that um, not having visited as much as probably my cousins would have or like other Bengali friends that I have, I found that a lot of it was a big identity rift at a younger age. So in my early to mid teens, it was, you know, you just didn't want to tell people you're Bengali. You didn't want to tell people you were anything other than British. And it was, it was part of it was the society that you live in and around that culture environment that you had. And I think for me, it was the biggest cultural shock when I ended up at university and I was on a BA in photography and I was the only brown person on my course. And on top of that, I was very visibly Muslim because I had a headscarf on my head. And that, that kind of cultural rift that you get, and in a way, by relearning who you are and by relearning these kind of ideals and what, where your roots really lie. I think that was something I found really resonated with me. And in a way, a lot of the work that I make now really hones into the fact that I had to relearn who I was. And a lot of it, I'm really thankful to the fact that it was through art. It was the fact that, you know, I wanted to, you know, explore art. And I mean, when I, once I started doing a lot of research around weaving and you, you learn about, you know, Bangladesh's history with weaving and you're like, wait, this didn't come from here. This came from Bangladesh. So I think like kind of those conversations that you have with a lot of people that really kind of pushed forward a lot of the work that I ended up making, and especially with Basha and especially working with Shamsul, it was, in a way, I felt that I, I could make a statement about something without having to recheck, wait, is this right or is this not? Can I say this? It was more of the fact that if I'm making the statement, I'm making it based on something that I resonate with. So I think that was really special to be able to work with another artist and work with someone. And especially with Shamsul's work, he works a lot around minority communities in Bangladesh. So again, his work was very outsider in comparison to the normal context of photography that you'd see in Bangladesh. So I think that's why we connected a lot better because I found that we were both making work about being outsiders, but in completely different contexts. Um, and when it comes to kind of thinking about 50 years of Bangladesh, I feel like in the past couple of years by relearning what it means to be Bengali, what it means to, you know, have this such a rich cultural heritage that I am a part of has become a lot more important. And I find that it's it's something that now, you know, I, I know all the like patriotic days that we have and I know why different things mean different things, which I wouldn't have had I been a lot younger and had I still had that same mentality. Um, I think there's little things that kind of play a part. I mean, um, my parents, um, when, when I went to mosque when I was younger, my mosque teacher was actually Bengali. So he ensured that we learn how to read Bengali. So I know how to read and learn Bengali, but none of my siblings do. So it's quite crazy to see that kind of like rift that you get because my spoken Bangla is a lot better than my siblings, which is why I find it's easier for me to communicate with my grandparents, both my maternal and paternal grandparents. Whereas I know with a lot of my siblings, you have to translate when they're trying to speak. So I think there's, there's a lot of things that I feel like in a way, being born and brought up in Britain are adapting to the lifestyle that we have here but a lot of it is kind of the cultural background that we've had that we've brought along with us so I think in, in a way I feel like it, it's still here and it's one of those things that we're still nurturing amongst ourselves and I know that it's something a lot of people are still so prideful about being a part of and especially to commemorate the fact that you know it's 50 years and that's such a big deal to be able to say that um, so yeah I think that's kind of a bit of what Bangladesh kind of means to me in a way and this 50 years means to me. Thank you it's wonderful to hear you speak about these sort of different transitions as you uh, change also through your practice and in conversation with other artists it sounds like an extremely fertile um, a collaboration as well. Um, we have another question in the chat that I'd like to pick up this is from, from Jafrin Gulshan who asks to each of you um, uh, I think um, she, she asks, I would like to know what are your personal stands in the patriarchal oppression? How do you find uh, courage to do your work? Which I think is a beautiful question. Um, uh, Rubaid, would you like to, to start? Yeah, well, I think patriarchal oppression is not okay. You know, it, you have to fight against it because 
I think we're born in, in a world and a culture that is male. That's very scary, that culture and history are mostly written by men. So as women, I think when we're born into this culture, we have to go through this process of self-examination that how much of what I perceive of myself and my desires as a woman, how much of it is um, imposed on me and how much of it is my own. So I think, you know, this like idea that womanhood is a myth and we're, we're in this constant undoing of gender, you know, and I think the, I don't think it's, it's really a matter of courage because I think it's a matter of right and wrong. It's not okay for an individual to oppress another individual on the basis of sex, gender, or skin color. So you should not have to put up, nobody should have to put up with this. And, you know, I think like thinking about 50 years of Bangladesh, I think Bangladeshi women are so resilient. I always talk about this example of women who have overcome domestic violence, uh, these young factory workers who are unionizing. So I think there are so many examples around us. Um, and when I was making Made in Bangladesh, I was so in, encouraged and inspired by these young women who are really taking on the world. So I think that um, that's one of the good things that I see happening in Bangladesh right now is women are really, um, you know, doing well in terms of education, in terms of jobs, and even though there's so much more that we need to really unlearn, at least women are out there, you know, they're out there in, in the, in the uh, very important part of the economy, which is something, you know, which is something I think is a little problematic, because right now I'm researching on women migrant workers, and I feel like the role of women's labor in Bangladesh's economy you know, where Bangladesh was in 71 versus where Bangladesh is now. And the role of women's labor in, in their contribution in this progress has, is totally not recognized at all. You know, you know that that's patriarchy, that women's labor are taken for granted. We have single mothers who are working in the Middle East and, you know, there's no national protection for these women when they go abroad to work. It's like they're disposable. Their lives are totally disposable. Thank you. Um, Dina, I see you making some notes. Would you like a moment or I can ask? Nulupa, would you prefer to respond? I'm first? muted. No, no, I, was, I can go if you yeah. want. Sure, let's mute it. Yeah. Um, I don't think of myself as particularly brave. And I don't know that I am to have these kinds of thinkings. I was very lucky. To, be, to grow up in a family with very strong female role models, right? And that was, the certain things were just expected of me that, you know, that I saw. So um, that's one thing. And I think that was just sheer luck where one ends up. Um, but I think um, early, I don't know. I, I had a very early, I spent three years in Manchester, England when I was very small, well, when I was, you know, between the ages of 12 and 15. And that was a long time ago. And that was really when the National Front and or whatever they were called, you know, I, I was exposed very early to racism. And so early on, I had a keen sense of injustice being interlocked. And maybe that's my interest in class too, that you can't disentangle a patriarchy from race and whatever else. So um, I carry that with me. So, if you have, you know, rage, I think it's good to have a little rage, feminist rage, whatever rage, you know, I think the rage pushes me sometimes. If you see injustice, you see rage, you know, you want to do something about it and I do nothing. I am just an academic. It's not that I do anything. I mean, really, in that sense, I write about things. I'm not sure how much courage it takes. I mean, you know, whatever. So it does sometimes because I won't be published. Certain things will simply be censored out. I know, you know, if you want to publish in certain places in certain countries, you know, there is there. I understand that, but I think um, I think my it's not even rage. I get outraged very easily, and that's what makes me right. I don't like the way people talk about things, so then I want to write about it. So that's that's what I do. It sounds like a, a, a long-standing feminist principle or dream yes. or classic text on the uses of anger as a as a motive. Right, exactly. It's a need for us to to step up. 
And Nilupa, I think you have thoughts on this. I definitely agree with a lot of stuff that Dina said about how it's, it's the anger. It's because you see it around you and you see that it's happening and it's happening so easily that you feel like this is this is not right. This shouldn't happen. And I definitely echo what she's meant about um, family. Families played a really important role in the way I have almost been born and brought up because I find that with like a lot of things which feel, when I think about it now they didn't seem as big then when I considered it but little things like you know um my mom pushing to like push me to learn to drive even though I had the most horrible driving instructor and she was like no you're gonna you're gonna learn to drive and little things like you know after college you were just you, you knew you were gonna go after school you'll go into college after college you'll go into university and it's little things like that that I see that are in my close knit so it's in my parents that I don't see in my cousins and I don't see in my extended family and it's little things like you know um coming home one day and I was like oh I've just signed up for my third degree and my mom's like oh you know that's good whereas my aunties are like but why do you want to do another degree don't you want to get married so it's yeah. those kind of like ideas that you have that you grow up with where you it, it almost kind of forces you to have to make a comment on there and I think for me being one of the eldest siblings and eldest child and only daughter I find that it's something I feel like owe it to all my cousins and my siblings that were going to come after me because I feel like if I don't if I don't say something now if I don't raise my voice to make a comment about something if I you know I'm 25 I'm not married it's not the end of the world if I don't say that then when the next sibling comes up I don't want ever I don't ever feel like my silence in a way resulted in their silence almost becoming just becoming compulsory so I think it's little things like that where I find in in a way the lifestyle the upbringing the family choices that I've made again choices like you know instead of pursuing that maths degree that everyone told me to do I went and pursued an arts degree things like that I feel like are quite important in terms of understanding that you you have to make a stand if you don't make that stand then you know no one else will and I've been really fortunate that my parents have always taught me that you know if it makes you happy you do it as long as you're not harming anyone and as long as it's not morally wrong to you 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 go out and you do it and I think if I didn't have that encouragement I wouldn't definitely wouldn't be making the work definitely would not be in the arts at all and especially to think about the fact that I am a working Muslim woman who is able to you know do everything that I've you know nothing nothing to me almost seems impossible to do I can go out and do what I want to do you know if I need to drive somewhere I can go and drive and it's one of those things that my mom always pick points now which is like remember when you hated it and you didn't want to go and do all those driving lessons now look where you can get to one place to the other and I think it's also the fact that in a way my my mom's raised me to understand that you know you don't need to rely on anyone you make your own money you go out there you enjoy what you're doing you can get from a to b and it's, it's little things like that where i feel like she she kind of wanted I, I, in, in some ways i feel like she wanted to do it and she just never got around to do it when she wanted to do it she does it now but she never got around to do it when she did so in a way she just kind of forced me that you know what you're gonna do it and it, little by little, I realized that a lot of the things that were really annoying at the time that my mom made me do, I am so grateful that I, I had, you know, I had the opportunity to do that in my family. So I think a lot of it does depend on that. And especially with, you know, making art and making very visual forms of art in an audience that uh, a lot of the times I feel like it comes back to the idea of um, that Dina mentioned about like you know the way the western um, media will always see the east and it's, it's those ideas and I mean I'm really interested in looking at orientalism and looking at the ideas of how mm. the gaze has changed and especially as someone who does a lot of self-portraiture in their own work I know automatically when someone sees an image of me what they're thinking when they see the headscarf on your head what they're thinking you know it's it's, it's those things that you know have almost been enlisted throughout history throughout society throughout the culture that we live in and you in a way, I feel like, I know, I know if maybe I might regret saying this, but I feel like you almost feel obliged that you need to do something about it. You need to say something about it because if you don't, then who else will? And I, I, I feel like it's one of those things. It's not, I'm not saying I'm writing history here, but if, I, if you don't change history, then it's one of those things that will just continuously carry on happening. And in a way, think of it as you doing this one thing today will make it a lot more easier for someone in five to ten generations that come after you that you know it, it can change that one thing for them so I think those are the things that I feel motivate me to continuously like keep on wanting to you know not break the patriarchy or fight the patriarchy but in a way I feel like you can't you can't stick to the way the patriarchy is just because of the way society has become um so yeah you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's very interesting hearing all three of you talk about how um, family and then um, quite sort of 
societal intersections between race and class, gender, religion, sexuality, as well as the institutions that Rubaid spoke about, education, the economy, uh, the, the union, how all of these provide a framework both to support patriarchy, but also provides the opportunities to, for each of you, I think, you all have a practice that is public facing, right, in which you engage other people into the possibilities of a transformation of all of these structuring factors, which I think is, is really powerful. And I think that's also where some of the, the questions from the audience are coming from, recognizing how each of your works allows us to both think differently, but also to see this example of how you write back, you weave back, you film back, you look back. Right, and therefore provide an opportunity for others to engage this. So I think it's, it's beautifully articulated here. Um, I would like to uh, still see if there's anyone in the audience who might feel like they want to, to ask a question of the three of you while they still have us all together here. Um, anyone wants to raise their hands, please do so. We welcome any, any questions you might have, or if you would like to put something in the chat, um, please do. You're very uh, welcome to do so as well. I'll give people a second to see if there's anyone there um, or whether they're happy to listen to us chat away. I feel we could go on for, for a while uh, still. Um, can I ask uh, otherwise to, to follow up on, on something that each of you have said, this question of family and the relationship to family and how that informs the ways in which you both um, enter the world quite literally, but also how it influences your, your practices as a writer, as a photographer, as a filmmaker. Um, what, is, what is the relationship to, to family as a, as, a, as a motivating factor, as a driving force, as perhaps um, a foundation from which you can practice? Anyone wants to pick that up? You're more than welcome. I'll go. Please. Um, well, you know, like like Bina Abbas said when she was young and she was in Birmingham, she faced racism. I feel like I faced this, you know, when I was four, my sister was born. And it was made quite clear in the family. Uh, I totally picked it up that a, a male child was desired, you know? And at the age of four, I knew, I totally knew that Okay, before that, I had no sense of my gender. I was just a person. But at the age of four, I knew that, okay, I'm a girl and a boy child is preferred. And if a boy child comes, then I'm gonna lose my privileges in the family. Mm -hmm. So I kind of really fought and I said, no, my mom is not gonna have another child. And, you know, and my mom decided not to have any more children. Um, and I always had this fear. I would even have dreams that my mom had a son and I was being shipped off to boarding school or something. Um, and you know, in Bangladesh, we don't have equal inheritance law. If I had had a brother, I wouldn't have inherited equally. I probably wouldn't have had the privileges to education that I did. And I kind of knew that even when I was four. So, you know, it's, it's not a surprise that this becomes my life because it was so instilled in me so early on um, that how in a, and when I was growing up, a lot of people would say, oh, do you have another sibling? And I'd say, yes, I have a sister. And they were like, oh, could buy me? <laughs> and this was just a very common question that I, uh, I grew up hearing in school uh, with relatives. So I think I was forced to recognize this, you know, very early on, which was not pleasurable. It was very painful. Uh, it was very painful. And I think only when I started doing gender studies, uh, women's studies, I found the diction to talk about this anger, this frustration that I had felt, uh, and I had tools to do something about it. You know, so like going up to Dina, like anger is what really drives me. You know, I try not to be so angry, but I think that's passion too, uh, that, okay, I'm gonna do something about it. And, um, you know, I always think about the women who came before me, like how my mother really made sure that I was educated. And, uh, you know, looking back at my grandmother, how she pushed my mother to education and my great grandmother. So I think um, the legacy of women in my family and how they really worked so hard. Like my great grandmother was married off when she was nine. And she learned 
from other girls who went to school and she wrote books. So like, if I look, look at her struggle and where I am, I think it's, it's like a generational thing that we have to keep pushing that women after me will have a better life than I did. Um, Nilupa, would you? Definitely echoing a lot of what Rubaiya said about my mom pushing me to be educated. And I think it's, it, it's been something that, so I'm the eldest of two brothers. So I'm the only daughter. And, um, I, I see the sexism at home. But I see the sexism at home in terms of um, doing household chores. My brothers just try and avoid it as much as they can. But also my mom lets them avoid it. So I think that that's something that I just kind of just grew up around. And it's something that irritates me till this day. So if my mom ever watches this, I'm going to be like, mom, I, I, I put you out on that. But um, I think it's, it's sometimes crazy to think that I'm actually, even though I am the eldest, I'm still the most educated from my two brothers and I feel like I always had that in me where my mom was like no you're gonna do this whereas they got a choice they got they got away with it if they didn't want to you know didn't want to go on and study on further whereas now I feel like sometimes some people actually still say to my mom that you know why you why are you letting her get so educated like you know what if no one wants to marry her? and it's always that marriage thing that comes up every time because I mean recently one of my aunties said to me she was like but like you know you're on your third degree what if like you know what if a guy doesn't want that? I was like, well, I want that. So, you know, I'm going to go out and do it. So I think it's it's definitely something that's kind of enlisted in that like main family, like my mom and dad have always encouraged that, you know, you go out there and you do that. So I think that that's helped a lot because I know for sure I wouldn't, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been able to kind of stand my ground if I didn't have that foundation in the first place. So it's definitely something that has been enlisted from home from the start. And it's also been something that once I started to relearn my own culture and my own heritage, and that played a part in my artwork that I was making, that I found that my connection with my mom got a lot stronger because suddenly she understood the art that I was making. P prior to that, um, a lot of the times when I said art, art school, I said photography, she just thought that, you know, it's just something she enjoys doing. So she's going to school and she's doing that. But suddenly it started to make sense to her. She started to understand that, okay, you know what, she's weaving and it, it, it means something. Suddenly I'm using Bangla text in my work and that means something. I'm asking her for translations for different words. And I think that in a way strengthened my bond with my mom and in a way, it, everything I was doing started to make sense. And even now, whenever I make something, I can share it with her and she'll understand it, even though English is on her first language. Sometimes I struggle trying to explain something to her in English, but now I feel like this is home to her. This work that I'm making is her first language. And to me, it's something that I'm relearning, but for her, it's something that she feels like she's just passed down to me, but it's it's not quite literally passed down to me, but it is it has been passed down. And I think also little things like when I first started weaving, it was done in a very arts and craft and art history movement uh, thematic way. But then learning about how my great grandmother was a weaver and she would weave utilitarian objects in Bangladesh. So she would make muras and um, shital patis and, you know, she'd make a living out of that. And a lot of the time um, it's crazy for me to think that, you know, my great grandmother did that many years ago and so many years later, I'm still making a living out of weaving. No one would believe that I'm doing that. But I think it's that kind of generational um, kind of inheritance in a way that has played a part in the work and in, in this kind of idea of family. And especially being able to make work around my mom and around the idea of like who my mom is, looking at archive images of my mom. I mean, there's photographs of me from the day I was born till today, whereas for my mom, there is no photographic evidence of her life before she had got married and moved to England. And that is again, something so interesting to think about and how cultures change and how generations have changed. And I mean, like at 25, my mom probably had three kids I think she did she had probably she had probably had all three of her kids by 25 and you know I'm a single independent woman where my main priorities are my education and you know going out there and doing more degrees so I think that's kind of you see that cultural shift in a way but the fact that I got the choice to do that I think that's really important because had I not been given that choice had my parents not implemented that choice onto me I definitely would not be doing or making any of the work that I am now. Nina. Mm. Right, I think generational inheritances are really important. And I think I've spoken about it a little bit, but, um, and I'm very unusual. I, most of my friends have similar experiences to what Rubaiyat is talking about, but I didn't, I, at home, I was in the safest possible space as far as gender relations were concerned. My father just did not, or my mother, if anything, I was the first child and the adored child. And I had a brother who was slightly neglected, I thought, at least for a while. Um, so, but 
it's sexism is what I saw at the moment I stepped out into the world. It was a very, so I have a very different relationship. I had to learn about sexism within Bengali households from looking at others. And perhaps that's why I'm a little bit more, um, I can talk more easily about interlocking forms of oppression or whatever I say, you know. It's an interesting thing to think about uh, how we approach, but I had a grandmother who, we grew up with stories about how my grandmother who had to raise eight children, you know, when her husband died, she did it all by herself, but made sure, told her daughters that they had to be financially independent and apparently sold the one gold chain that she had for my youngest aunt so that the aunt could go on a art trip to Kolkata or somewhere rather than saving it for the wedding. And I think that kind, those kinds of stories make a difference, the stories that you grow up with. That's something I thought, just to get back to the film, just for one minute, if we have time, and kinship, it's so, I, I, one of the things that I think the film is arguing for is maybe women can find a space outside of kinship too, with outside of motherhood, for instance, right? And I think that's important also, even as we um, acknowledge our family inheritances, that there have to be created spaces that are not necessarily, or, or we have different forms of family maybe even. That I thought the film, and one last thing about the film, and it, you know, I had a lot to say about machines, and numbers that I thought would just come out anyway, so I didn't. But the disposability, the way in which I see sexism in an everyday sense in, is in the way women's bodies are made disposable. So yes, the garment worker's body is very obviously disposable, but this woman, Roya, who's 32 and who's being cast aside for a 21-year-old more nubile body, I think that shows how women are interchangeable also in middle-class lives. You know, in their, you know, what mattered was that you had a slightly slimmer, quote unquote, prettier girl, her talent, nothing mattered. And I think that shows, and that's where I see everyday sexism that we don't, or whatever you want to call it, patriarchy at work in a way that we really need to take on. It's not simply about men keeping women down quite literally or men beating. It's something else that I think Rubaiyat film brings up. That's less, that's just taken for granted at the hobby. Of course, piano hobby, right? That's something to think about. Absolutely, no, and I think um, the film has given us the opportunity to reflect on this huge variety of, of themes and topics exactly because it, it so powerfully articulates these different relationships amongst different women, differently generationally positioned, different right. individualities. Personally, one of my most favorite shots in the film is when she's in the bath and there are these other species with her there. And it, it just opens out the possibility for women's connectivity and togetherness in this really immersive, I mean, literally immersive, but also cinematically immersive moment, which is, I think, just a beautiful place. And, and I think maybe we can end our conversation um, today here at that possibility for a connection out into the world, um, but also thinking about what's been passed down, what we inherit, how we take that on, how it empowers us, but also in the ways in which it holds us back um, as we discuss art and feminism and 50 years of Bangladesh. Thank you all so incredibly much for this fantastic conversation, this very fertile, moving between different sites and different moments. Um, it's been an absolute joy. Just want to thank you all, Rubai Tassin, Dina Siddiqui, Nilupa Yasmin, for, for being in this conversation today. Rebecca Bridgman from the Birmingham Museum and Luva Nahid Chowdhury of the Bengal Foundation. Thank you for making it possible for us and all of those who've been here today and maybe later on who will see this asynchronously, as they say <laughs> on YouTube. Thank you so much for this. It's been a wonderful um, afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Lotte. I'm sorry we didn't quite get the chance to introduce you at the beginning of the seminar, so I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us. Um, for those of you that don't know Lotte and her work, she's a senior lecturer in anthropology at the University of Edinburgh, um, and we're hugely grateful to the fantastic job you've done for chairing the seminar today. Um, I don't know whether you have a, a final word, Luva, before we finish. 
It was absolutely fascinating. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Rebecca. And I think we need to thank our colleagues uh, at yeah. uh, the Birmingham Museums Trust and at uh, Bengal Foundation who put in a lot of work yeah. so that uh, we could have this. Thank you and good night from us. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.